Hello, everybody. My name is Becky. I'm with Tampa Hillsborough County Public Library. I'm joined today by my co-host, Joelle, and our presenter, Marian blumenthal is on. I am so thrilled to have you join us for this evening's program. Marian blumenthal is on My Holocaust Story. This is being presented as part of Jewish American Heritage Month. So we have read about history in textbooks. We've Googled topics on the internet. We may have even watched some documentaries on the History Channel, but there are very few opportunities in our lives to actually hear from someone who has survived and truly lived moments of history. Today, you will have the unique experience and privilege of hearing firsthand from a woman who is both a witness to and is a Holocaust survivor, a victim of history. I hope that you will listen, understand, and appreciate the message of hope, courage, compassion that she will share with you today. I first met Marion several years ago when I think I was in fifth or sixth grade. Uh, I was able to hear her story live in person and read her book, Four Perfect Pebbles. I still have the book with me to this very day. It has been one of my treasured items that I've carried as I've moved around. It is my honor now to introduce our special guest, Mrs. Marion blumenthal Lazan. Thank you, Becky. Thank you so much for your meaningful and kind introduction. Amazing, remarkable that you remember me from so many, many years ago, 27 years ago. I thank you and Joelle for giving me the opportunity to present to your Tampa Hillsbury County Public Library patrons and beyond. This evening, I'm here with all of you to share my story. It is my childhood experiences during World War II in the concentration camps. I will tell you about our liberation and how we finally started our lives anew in our blessed United States of America. Mine is a story that Anne Frank might have told had she survived. And as most of you know, I think all of you know, Anne Frank was a young Jewish girl who died along with most of her family in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. This is also a story that conveys a message of perseverance, determination, faith, and above all hope. After the presentation, I will be pleased to answer some of your questions. Life in the early 1930s in Germany was very much for my family, as it is here for most of you today. Never did we think that the anti-Semitic incidents there would ever lead to very much. My father was in a successful shoe business in a small town. My parents, two year older brother and I lived comfortably with my grandparents above the shoe store. Life for Jews was made increasingly more difficult. And in 1935, the Nuremberg laws were formulated and enforced. The following are just some of the many restrictions imposed on the Jews in Germany. Jews were not allowed into theaters, into parks, or into swimming pools. All public schools were closed to Jewish children. Then there was the evening curfew for the Jews. Jews were only allowed to shop during specific hours of the day, and non-Jews were not allowed to shop in Jewish-owned stores. Non-Jews were just not allowed to associate with Jewish people. And then, a big letter J for Jew was stamped on ID cards and on passports. These restrictions went on and on. And it was then that my parents decided to make arrangements to leave the country. My grandparents, who were in the late 70s and ill, refused to leave their home. They could not understand the urgency or the necessity of doing so. My grandparents passed away in 1938, just 11 days within each other. And soon thereafter, we received our necessary papers for our emigration to America. I was just four years old at that time. November 9th, 1938, Kristallnacht or Crystal Night 
it was the night of broken glass when the Nazis and their many followers smashed the windows and the storefronts of Jewish owned stores. Jewish establishments, synagogues, and Jewish books were burned and destroyed. This was the beginning of a massive pogrom against the Jews in Germany, a massive verbal and physical assault against all German Jews. In reality, this was the beginning of the Holocaust. On November 12th, following Kristallnacht, the German government actually fined the Jewish population for the damage caused that night. These imposed taxes were used to rearm Germany. The night of Kristallnacht, our apartment was ransacked. All valuables were thrown into a pillowcase and taken away. But worst of all was that they forcibly transported my father to concentration camp Buchenwald in Germany. All sorts of terrible stories were related to my mother, and we did not know if we would ever see my father again. He was released after three weeks, only because our papers were in order for our emigration to America. And to think that just a few years prior, he had been awarded the Iron Cross for his military service in the German Army of World War I. We were forced to sell both our home and our business for a fraction of its worth. And soon thereafter, in January of 1939, we left for Holland from where we were to sail to the United States. And for almost nine months, while awaiting our quota number from the American State Department, my parents were assigned to take care of some 125 children. These young children had been sent by their parents from various parts of Europe to escape from the Nazis. In December of that year, 1939, we were deported to the detention camp of Westerbork in Holland to await our departure day to America. Camp Westerbork was constructed by the Dutch to accommodate Jews from various parts of Europe. In May of 1940, just one month before our planned departure date, the Germans invaded Holland and we were trapped. All of our belongings, which were about to be loaded on board ship, were burned and destroyed as the harbor of Rotterdam was bombed. Under Dutch control, Camp Westerbork was tolerable. My mother, father, brother, and I shared two small rooms. We all ate in a communal dining room, and at that time there was enough food for us so that we did not go hungry. Adults were assigned to various work duties. My father worked to repair shoes. My mother worked in the kitchen. We children had a makeshift education and lived a very dull, stagnant life. Several months later, when the Nazi SS took over the command of Westerbork, we became acquainted with the ever-present, terrifying 12-foot high barbed wire. And as thousands of Jews were rounded up, many taken from their hiding places, as was Anne Frank and her family, Camp Westerbock became overcrowded. And it was at that time that we had to share our small quarters with another family. And then the dreadful transports to the concentration and extermination camps in Eastern Europe began. This started in early 1942. And from then on, every Monday night, lists of those to be deported were posted, causing incredible anxiety, anguish, and fear. And then on Tuesday mornings, men, women, and little ones were marched to a nearby railroad platform from where they were transported. This area became known as Boulevard de Misere. It was an area of complete misery. At 11 o'clock on Tuesday mornings, the trains left for their destination. And of the total 120,000 men, women, and children that departed Westerbork, 102,000 were doomed never to return. In January of 1944, it was our turn to be shipped out. We children were actually glad for a change of environment. We were very naive and we welcomed the move. We were allowed to take one knapsack each and whatever we could stuff into it, we were permitted to take. 
when we approached the railroad platform and we saw the cattle cars in which we were to travel, our fears began to mount. Adults suspected, and they somehow knew what was in store for us. I remember that it was a bitter cold, pitch black, rainy night when we arrived at our destination, concentration camp Bergen-Belsen in Germany. We were pulled and dragged out of the cattle cars and greeted by the German guards who were shouting at us and threatening us with their weapons and with the most vicious attack dogs by their sides. I was a very frightened nine-year-old and to this day, I still feel a certain sense of fear whenever I see a German shepherd. Bergen-Belsen was divided into various areas. It was sectioned off and surrounded by electrified barbed wire. Guards were always in strategically placed high guard towers. And in the evenings, as soon as it would turn dark, the bright searchlights from above would constantly sweep the campgrounds. We were placed in a section that was known as the Stan Lager or the Star Camp, named so because we had to continue wearing that yellow star, which had been issued to us back in Holland. Men were on one side of the camp and the women on the other, and this did make it possible at times for families to get a glimpse of one another. We were placed in this particular section of the camp with the hope of being exchanged for German nationals in Palestine, who the British put under house arrest because they were citizens of an enemy country. Unfortunately, that hope never materialized for our family. 600 of us, 600 of our people were crammed into each of the crude, wooden, heatless barracks meant for 100 when originally built. There were triple-decker bunk beds with two people sharing each bunk. German winters were bitter cold and very long. We were given only one thin blanket per bunk and a straw-filled mattress. And this bunk was our only living quarters and that for two people. I was very lucky that I was able to share a bunk with my mother and that my brother was able to share a bunk with our father. But can you imagine two adults, two strangers, sharing a bunk under such horrendous conditions, a bunk that was no larger than the small cupboard that we're all so familiar with. I remember the first time seeing a wagon filled with what I thought was firewood for the one small oven that we had in our barrack. That oven, of course, was never used. I soon realized that what was in the wagon were dead, naked bodies thrown one on top of the other. Toilets and so-called washing facilities were at a great distance in the most primitive outhouses. Toilets were long wooden benches with holes cut into them, one next to the other. There was no privacy, there was no toilet paper, there was no soap, and hardly ever any water with which to wash. And in the almost year and a half that we were in Bag and Belsen, never once were we able to brush our teeth. There were no trees, no flowers, nor did we ever see a blade of grass. And whenever it rained, we had to slosh through the mud, adding even more misery to our very dismal existence. Every morning, every single morning, without fail, we were ordered to line up on a huge field. It was called an Appellplatz, five in a row as we were counted. We would have to stand there until each and every one of us was accounted for, often from early morning till late at night without food, without water, no matter what the weather, without protective clothing. Frostbite was common. We would treat our affected toes and fingers with the warmth of our own urine. Our diet consisted of a slice of bread a day, some hot watery soup with grizzly meats and turnips and potato peels, Bread was later cut back and given to us just once a week and only if our so-called quarters were neat and in order. 
our birthday present to one another was that little piece of bread that we had saved up from the previous week. Once a month, we were marched to an area to shower, and there, under the watchful eyes of the gods, we were ordered to undress. We had heard about exterminations and gas chambers in other areas of Europe, and we therefore were never sure when the faucets were turned on as to what would come out, water or gas. The Nazis did their utmost to break us physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Unfortunately, they did succeed with many of our people. It was not uncommon for people who were no longer responsible for their actions to attempt escape, even though they knew that the chance to succeed was next to impossible. But they also felt that they had nothing more to lose. The failure of their attempts were obvious when we saw their lifeless bodies hanging electrocuted against the barbed wire. Malnutrition, dysentery, and the loss of the will to go on is what destroyed body and mind. Death was an everyday occurrence. The dark crowded quarters often caused us to trip and fall over the dead. Bodies could not be taken away fast enough. We as children saw things that no one, no matter what the age, should ever have to see. I know, of course, that you've all heard, you've read, you've seen movies, perhaps even two documentaries about the Holocaust. But the constant foul odor, the filth, continuous horror and fear surrounded by death is indescribable. There is no way that this can be put accurately into words or pictures. Our bodies, hair and clothes, were infested with lice. We learned that there is a distinct difference between head lice and clothes lice. Squashing them between my thumbnails became my primary pastime. Much of my time was taken up with make-believe games. And one game, a game based on superstition, became very important to me. I decided that if I were to find four pebbles of about the same size and shape, that that would mean that the four members of my family would all survive. My mother, my father, my brother, and I. It was a torturous, painful, very difficult game to play. What if I couldn't find the third or fourth pebble? Might that mean that one or two of my family members would not pull through? Nevertheless, this game gave me something to hold on to, some distant hope. After a number of months on our meager diets, our stomach shrunk so that the hunger was no longer painful. Teenagers and men suffered most from malnutrition and were the first to die. Those who lasted the longest were the women and mothers in particular. It was their strong will to keep their children alive that kept them going. And my mother was one of those remarkable ladies. There is no doubt in my mind that it was my mother's inner strength and fortitude that finally saw us through. One day, my mother was able to smuggle some potatoes and some salt from the kitchen where she worked and somehow, somehow managed to cook some soup in secret. This was done on our bunk. I was on the bunk with her trying to hide and shield what she was doing. Soup was simmering, just about finished, when the German guards entered our barrack for surprise inspection. In our rush to hide that setup, the boiling soup spilled on my leg. We had been taught self-discipline and self-control the hard way, for I knew for sure, had I cried out, it would have cost us our lives. This happened in the spring of 1945. I was just 10 years old. The population in Camp and Belsen were dying off rapidly, but not nearly fast enough to satisfy the Nazis. Several weeks later, it was decided to send three trainloads of our people to Eastern Europe towards the extermination camps and the gas chambers. We did not know that Auschwitz with its gas chambers had already been liberated. My family was among the 2,500 on the last of these three trains. 
It was April of 1945. Russian army was closing in from the Northeast and the British and the Americans from the West. Under normal conditions, this train ride from Bergen-Belsen to whatever area of Eastern Europe they were going to send us would have taken no more than 10 hours. But because the Germans tried to evade the Allies, we were en route for two long weeks without food, without water, without medical supplies, without sanitary facilities. That meant no toilets. When the train came to a stop, those who were able and those who were strong enough were permitted to get out and take a drink from a nearby stream or dig up woods to eat. My mother remembered taking some sort of a pot and collecting water from the locomotive. And who knows what else that pot was used for. The need for water at that time was almost more important than food because of the severe dehydration due to the dysentery and the high fever due to the typhus. Let me briefly explain typhus. It is a highly contagious, deadly disease that's caused from filth and spread by lice. At the same time, while the train was at a standstill, the newly dead were taken off and buried along the tracks. In addition, our train was subject to frequent air attacks by the Allies. It is truly remarkable how any one of us was able to survive under such horrendous conditions. In fact, 500 of our people, that's one out of every five, died en route or shortly thereafter. My burned leg was severely infected and it was impossible to keep the wound clean or lice free. In late April, after 14 days of this surreal and horrifying journey, German guards stormed frantically through the train seeking civilian clothing so that they would not be recognized by the Allies. And we knew then that the war was coming to an end. It was the Russian army that liberated our train and led us to a nearby farm village in eastern Germany. Most of the inhabitants had fled and we took over their homes. Kitchens were stocked with ample food. It was rich and good, actually much too good for our staff bodies. We could not tolerate that unfamiliar nourishment. And at that time, at the age of 10 and a half, I weighed 16 kilos, or as we know it here, 35 pounds. And my mother had weighed a mere 70 pounds. The Russians, in a crude way, tried to help us the best that they could. I was brought to a nearby clinic for medical attention. My leg was in very bad condition and I was close to losing it. Fortunately, it was decided to treat the wound and I was very lucky that my leg responded to medication and it gradually healed. As I regained my strength, I also relearned to walk. And in the interim, our heads were shaved because that was the only way that we could rid ourselves of head lice. Although we were all weak, ill, and thoroughly exhausted, I vividly remember the spring of 1945. Weather was beautiful, sunny and bright. Trees and grass were lush and green. Flowers were in bloom, birds were singing. It was a wonderful, exciting feeling to be free at long last. We were all ill with typhus, but my father had to die from it. Six weeks after our liberation and this after six and a half years of mental torment and physical abuse my 12 year old brother albert actually helped bury our father when i talk about those years it is as though i'm relating a nightmare a very bad dream i separate myself from it ever having happened to me and that is how i deal with it it is a wonderful story of how we gradually recuperated and were sent back to Holland to start our lives anew. My brother and I were eventually placed in the children's home in preparation to live in what was then British mandated Palestine and we know today as Israel. Most of the children in this home survived alone without their parents. I felt like a total misfit. I needed to learn how to resettle into a normal society. Had no training for that. Here I was by this time, 11 years old. 
I had never been in a store, had no idea what money was all about, had almost no table manners. It was like learning to live all over again. It was in this home that we became reacquainted with life in its normal state. Meals served us were delicious and nourishing. You can imagine that just about anything and everything tasted good to us. And though our surrogate parents provided a very strict environment, much love and care were given us. I began my first formal education at that time at the age of 11 and a half. We were taught the secular subjects, reading, writing, arithmetic in a Montessori school where we progressed at our own pace. The Dutch language in which we were taught was all new to us. We also received a thorough education in Hebrew and in religious studies. The British, who were governing Palestine in the 1940s, had issued what was known as the White Paper, restricting the number of Jews permitted into the land. They were intercepting many of the refugee ships and interning the survivors on the island of Cyprus, and in some cases, turning the ships back to Europe. In November of 1947, the United Nations voted to partition Palestine between Arabs and Jews, which in May of 1948 led to the establishment of the State of Israel. In 1947, just one year prior to Israel becoming a state, our illegal voyage from Holland to Palestine was planned and danger once again loomed over us. And because parents at that time were not permitted to accompany their children, my mother managed to make arrangements for a family of three to emigrate to the United States. And thanks to the Holland America line, we were able to use the tickets which had been purchased 10 years earlier. We arrived in Hoboken, New Jersey, April 23rd, 1948, by coincidence, exactly three years to the day of our liberation. It was a Jewish relief organization, the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, that found a home for us in Peoria, Illinois. I had never heard of Illinois, definitely not Peoria. And there, at the age of 13, I once again started life anew in a strange land and again learning a new language. My third new language in less than three years. First Dutch, then Hebrew, and now English. And because of my inability to speak English, I, at the age of 13, was placed in the fourth grade with nine-year-olds. Although both my brother and I worked long hours after school to help our mom pay bills, I nevertheless found time, actually made time, to take extra courses during the year, attend summer school, and by working very hard in my studies, I was able to be graduated from Peoria Central High School five years later at age 18, ranking eighth in a class of 267 students. It was two months after high school graduation that I was married to Nathaniel Lazan, who I had met at the age of 16 in Peoria. And God willing, we'll be celebrating our 70th wedding anniversary this coming August. Nathaniel, come say hello to the nice people uh, in Florida and everywhere else. This is Nathaniel. He's amazing. Nathaniel was an Air Force pilot and, of course, is very, very conscientious and disciplined. I am grateful. I am very grateful that I survived healthy in body, mind, and spirit, and that together with my husband, I'm able to perpetuate my friend but my heritage with a wonderful family. We have three grown children, all three are happily married, and they've given us nine beautiful grandchildren and 11 extraordinary, amazing, beautiful, great grandchildren. Amazing, amazing. I refer to that as survival and continuity for sure. And in March of 1996, my memoir, Four Perfect Pebbles, co-authored by Lila Pearl, was published by Green Willow Division of HarperCollins. It is now in its 34th printing in hardback. And then HarperCollins decided to do a 20th anniversary edition, and this is it. 
I don't know if you can see this, but I definitely don't like this cover and they know it. It's that barbed wire that really bothers me, but Harper was in charge and this is it. Uh, has Scholastic Book Club has made it available since 1999, been translated into German, into Dutch, and Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum Jerusalem, published it in Hebrew. They did a super job on it. This is my image when I was seven. And if you are like, you may read it in Japanese. Maybe there's someone in the audience who can do just that. But above all, I am so grateful that the story is in book form so that it can be passed on to future generations. And I'm thrilled that a documentary has been made entitled Marion's Triumph with the actress Deborah Messing as the narrator. So you see that despite all the terrible things that happened to me as a child, my life today is full and rewarding. Although I've spoken to upward of 2 million students and adults over these past 25, 30 years, it still has not become easy. However, I do realize the importance of sharing that period of our history with you, simply because in a few short years, we will not be here any longer. It's today's generation, today's young people are the very last who will hear these stories firsthand. And I therefore ask them in particular to please share my story or any of the Holocaust stories that they read and hear about. Please share them with your family, share them with your friends, and someday, someday share them with your children. And yes, even with your grandchildren. When we are not here any longer, it is your generation that will have to bear witness. As difficult as it is, the horror of the Holocaust must be taught, must be studied and kept alive. Only then can we guard it from ever happening again. This, this is the very yellow star that I was forced to wear. It says Jude, which in German means Jew. It's just another way to denigrate us, to isolate us, and to set us apart from the rest of society. This represents the Star of David, a beautiful, meaningful Jewish symbol. But the Nazis made it so very ugly. Each of us, each and every one of us must do everything in our power to prevent such hatred, such destruction, and such terror from reoccurring. And we can begin by having love, respect, and tolerance towards one another, regardless of the religious belief, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of the national origin. This respect towards one another must begin in our homes around the kitchen table, dining room table, wherever we gather as a family. We, the adults, must pass it on our places of business. The students in their classrooms, halls of their schools, communities, towns, cities. And only if there's respect and compassion and tolerance towards one another in the countries can we expect to have peace in the world. We must begin with our children. Let us treat people as individuals. Let us look for similarities and respect the differences. Let us build bridges and reach out towards one another. And we must be true to ourselves and not blindly follow a leader without thinking ahead and searching our hearts and our minds as to what the consequences might be. When I speak in schools, I tell the students it is not cool to follow just anyone's lead without first checking to see what his or her true intentions are. Please, please let us all remember these messages and let us all live by them. We're all aware, or we should be, that six million Jewish people were murdered during the Holocaust. Six million. The population of Florida is approximately 21 million thereabouts. Can you possibly imagine 
almost one out of every three people in Florida wiped out. The six million also represent one third of the entire pre-World War II Jewish population. Among them were one and a half million children. We also need to remember that there were five million non-Jews who lost their lives. Among them were the righteous Gentiles, as we refer to them, very special people, non-Jews who jeopardized their lives to save Jewish families. They would hide them in the attics. They would hide them in the basements. Farmers would hide them out in the barns. They were hidden in convents. And when these good people were caught doing what they thought was the right thing to do, they also were deported to concentration camps and in many cases lost their lives. And that brings me to another message. We must never generalize and judge an entire group by the actions of some within that group. These are all universal messages, messages that each and every one of us is familiar with to varying degrees, but need to be reminded of over and over again. And this certainly was a good opportunity to do so. These messages are the lessons learned from that dark period of our history and certainly apply to today's world situation and definitely to our own individual lives. By listening, I hope that our young people prevent our past from becoming their future. Okay, I need to share something with you about an extraordinary lady, my mother. This was my mother on her 104th birthday. Remarkable, amazing lady. Mom passed away six weeks short of 105. Um, there were two things that my mother demanded of my brother and me when we came to America. Number one, learn English. Learn it quickly. Number two, work as hard as you can in school and at work in order to succeed. When mom was still with us, we were five generations of women, five. And uh, again, as I mentioned before, survival and continuity for sure. My mother came to America at the age of 40, knew absolutely no English, learned to read, write, and speak a magnificent English, a very wise, special lady. She was a fabulous mother-in-law to Nathaniel, and he was extraordinary to my mother two wonderful people for sure. My brother, Albert, passed away a few years ago, dealt with this altogether differently than I. Did not talk about it as freely as you heard it from me this evening. Was happily married, but by choice did not bring children into this world. Had a very difficult time with organized religion. All of that made me very sad. But I didn't fault Albert. We have to remember he was two years older than I am, was with my father in the men's section. And I am convinced that he saw and experienced things that I did not. God puts us on this earth, gives us a beautiful mind. It is this mind that allows us to choose right from wrong, good from evil. Therefore, men did this towards one another. But did he have to make it so bitterly cold when we were standing out there on our pillow all day? I have a direct line. I ask loads of questions. Don't get too many answers, but that's okay. Faith I will always have. After all, here I am, three children, nine grandchildren, 11 great-grandchildren from whom generations will be forthcoming. He made sure that enough of us survived so that we will always be here. I am proud of my faith, as I'm certain you are all proud of your faith and of your heritage. But please, please let us all remember to respect the right of others to their belief. Be kind and good and respectful towards one another. That is the basis for peace. Be kind and good towards one another. There's very little that we can, if, if there had been respect and tolerance, some 75, 80 years ago, I would not be here with you this evening to share that dark period of our history. I know that. Iraq, uh, the Afghanistan, Syria, 
the Ukraine, all these countries that are in such turmoil would be peaceful countries for its people. Be kind and good and respectful towards one another, please. There's very little that we can do against the negativity in our world, but how we treat, behave, and reach out towards one another, that is entirely up to us. Did I ever find my four pebbles? It's a frequently asked question. I always found my four pebbles. I made it my business to find them. I cheated all the time. When I found them, I put them in a safe place. Next time I searched for them, I couldn't find that third one or that fourth one. Well, I knew exactly where to go and pick them up. Maybe that was cheating, but it was my game. And guess who made the rules? You need to know that I was only about nine or 10 years old when things were at its absolute worst. We had nothing, nothing to occupy our time with constructively. No paper, no pencils, no books, certainly no games. So I was lucky at such an imaginative mind. My imaginative games were always based on a positive attitude. I would search for a piece of glass or a piece of a mirror, whatever I could find on the dirt ground in Bag and Belsen. And when the sun would shine, and that didn't happen nearly often enough in that part of Germany, known for bad weather and cloudy skies, but I, Marion, knew that that sun would always come out. And when it did, that little piece of glass would cast a reflection onto the ground. And that little wiggly reflection, it became my pet. As long as the sun would shine, I would have my pet, and my pet would never, ever die. I would also imagine that one day, I once again would have my three Bs. And these three Bs represent our everyday comforts and necessities that we all take so much for granted. First, we represented a bed. I knew that someday I once again would have my very own bed with a real mattress, clean sheets, and enough blankets to keep me warm. Second B represented a bath, warm water, soap, clean towels, and with that would come toothpaste and toothbrush, of course. And the third B was bread. I knew that someday I once again would have enough bread so that I would never again go hungry. These imaginative games, if you will, they were my survival techniques. They were my survival skills. Do you know that we all have survival techniques and skills within us? When the need arises, we just have to search for them, find them, and be sure that we put them to work. No one is spared adversity. No one is spared hardship. We all have to overcome obstacles at one time or another. But with perseverance, with determination, with faith, and above all hope, one can overcome just about anything and everything. Above all, never, ever give up hope. It is not so much what happens to a person, it's how we deal with the situation that makes the difference. Nathaniel is from New York. He went to Bradley University in Peoria, lucky me. He went home on vacations, and way back then in the 1950s, long-distance telephone calls were very expensive. There, of course, were no computers, there was no texting, none of that technology, but there was a three-cent stamp. There really was such a thing as a three-cent stamp. And with this three-cent stamp, we would write to one another every single day major, major problems. In his letters to me, he would add five words. I happen to know that were more than five words in that. There had to be at least 10 words that you asked me to define and put into a sentence. It's a lot of nerve with all I had to do, but I knew he meant to help me with my English and I guess it did work. So thank you, Nathaniel. It was my pleasure, Marianne. And I, on the other hand, would write my letters in rough draft with the dictionary by my side. And only when I was satisfied with the way the letter was written would I dare mail it to him. Talking about a dictionary, my father always carried a little chunky German English dictionary with him. And he would study the vocabulary in secret whenever possible, always with the hope that someday he would reach America. When we came to the United States back in 1948 and approached New York Harbor, we were told the night before that if we wanted to see the Statue of Liberty, we needed to be on deck bright and early the next morning. 
Well, you can be sure that each and every one of us was on deck to greet and be greeted by that magnificent symbol of freedom, the freedom that had been denied us for so many years. And when that tall figure of that long for symbol appeared, I became too choked up to talk. So many emotions seized me at once, joy and gratitude, bitterness for the cruelties we and so many others had suffered, and deep, deep sadness that my father would never know that we had reached America at last. And when we crossed the Verrazano Bridge, the Verrazano Bridge is a long bridge in New York that connects the borough of Staten Island with that of Brooklyn. And when we reach a certain point on that bridge, I will always crane my neck to see the Statue of Liberty. It, to me, it's one of the most magnificent, beautiful, meaningful sights anywhere. We returned to Germany on several occasions, or at least seven or eight times. And uh, the very first time was back in 1995. It was the 50th anniversary of our liberation. And we visited my father's grave. And the reason my father and about 60 others have a private resting place in that farm village where we were liberated was because they died after some of the chaos had subsided. Those who died early on were all buried in mass graves. We also went to Bergen-Belsen. Bergen-Belsen looks nothing the way I remembered it. Had been burned down under the direction of President Eisenhower, who was then the commander of the Allied forces, because the conditions of the camp would have created tremendous health hazards for that entire region of Germany. So today, other than the newly built documentation exhibition centers, Bergen-Belsen looks like a park, green grass, shrubs, trees, really not bad looking at all except for the mounds everywhere. Mounds with plaques that read, here lie a thousand, here lie 2,500. These are the mass graves of our people. We also went to my former hometown of Hoya near Hanover. And there we were greeted by public officials who constantly uh, apologize. And there was a young non-Jewish couple who born after the war, who took her to the Jewish cemetery, which was in terrible disarray, had not been cared for since 1938, took us to our family plot. And there among the top of those stones was a brand new shiny granite footstone with the inscription, Zu Erinnerung an die zerstörte Grabstelle der Familie Blumenthal, Hoya 1894 bis 1938. In memory of the desecrated plot of the Blumenthal family, Hoya 1894 to 1938, placed there by this non Jewish young couple, unbeknownst to us, a most beautiful, generous, kind gesture. Never thought that I would refer to non Jewish Germans in such glowing terms. And it's people like these that renew one's faith in humanity and have become dear, dear friends of ours. And whenever we returned, um, I would speak in schools, do so in German, speak in schools and university and churches, and uh, tremendously well received, but oh, so difficult for today's young people in that country to hear. After all, it happened in them in their country by their own grandparents and great grandparents generation. It's a huge, huge burden for these young people. And unfortunately, it will be their burden for generations to come. And then we returned in 2010 because a brand new public high school in my former hometown was named in my honor. So now we have the Marion Blumenthal Oberschule in Hoya, a tremendous celebration and very courageous for this little town to redress what happened so many years ago in their midst. And the night before the celebration, we commemorated the night of broken glass on the site where our synagogue once stood. All difficult trips for sure, but no regrets having returned. I need you to know that Germany is doing everything in its power to continually remind the people as to what happened so many years ago. For one thing, it is mandatory for the subject to be taught in their schools, and it's against the law 
to deny that the Holocaust has happened. And then they came up with something a number of years ago. It's called Ein Stolperstein, a stumbling block. You don't stumble over it. It's a metal plaque that's deeply embedded in the sidewalk of the home where the person once lived and never returned. And on that plaque is engraved his or her name, date of birth, where, when, and how he or she died. All that is engraved on that plaque. And um, it's certainly a tremendous tribute for those people who never returned, who were perished. Okay, before I wind down, Becky, if there are any questions, I will be pleased to answer them. Yes, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. I do have a few questions, but actually first I'm going to have Joelle go over our um, our genealogy page here, our additional library resource, and then we'll get to the questions. So that way if anybody has questions to add, they can add, they can start typing while Joelle reads. Hello everybody. If you would like to find out more about your heritage, um, I'm sorry, if you'd like to find out more information about genealogy or your own heritage, you can visit our history and genealogy page. Now, quick tip, if you scan the QR code to the left of the screen, it will take you right to the history and genealogy page. Otherwise, you can find the page at hcpsmpaullc.org, click on learning and research at the top, and then click on the genealogy and history tab. All right, thank you so much, Joelle. And of course, we do have Marion's book as well, Four Perfect Pebbles, and seen here is the 20th anniversary cover, which is the one I still have from when I was way back in elementary school. We also have the 20th anniversary uh, copy that Marion mentioned, and we have this available both in, phys uh, in physical forms. We have it available in the Hoopla app, the Libby app, and also Access 360. So there's multiple ways that you can get this. With Hoopla, there's never any way you can get it instantly, so you can sign on right now through your library and get it right away. And now we'll go ahead and ask some of your questions. Let me go see if I can get to the top of those. All right, um, so one person asked, can you recall any acts of kindness in the camps? Any acts of kindness, yes. Um, it was when my brother was given an apple from a guard. Had this guard been caught giving a little Jewish boy an apple, he would have been punished severely, if not worse, for sure. And where there was one, there had to be others, but there were nearly enough who um, were kind and good, for sure. There were too many that followed the lead of the guy with the mustache, and that was the problem. Mm -hmm. Let's see what else. Oh, one person asked where they could get a signed copy of your book, if that's available. <laughs> well, a signed copy, um, if you, I don't know where, where this person is from. Uh, <laughs> If you, well, I have a website, mm -hmm. yeah, and you can, or you can email me, and uh, and I can send you a book label or book, um, a book a, plate, a book plate, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and I will send that to you, and you can adhere that into your book, and you can get the book mm -hmm. from from Amazon, I imagine, on many other areas, mm -hmm. or from Harper Harper Collins, direct from Harper Collins, <laughs> I'd be happy to send you a book. Okay, yeah, we're so really so grateful to have this wonderful technology. Um, we haven't, we used to travel a lot, sometimes two round trip flights a month, mm -hmm. but since COVID and some other medical problems, we haven't been traveling. But we are fortunate to have this wonderful technology. And when I speak in schools, and I do that mostly, I speak in schools, um, I tell the students to please, please use this wonderful technology for good only. Do not disparage others. Do not intimidate others. Do not embarrass your friends. And also, don't believe everything that you read on the internet social or the media. social media thing. Just don't. Use your own smart, bright minds before you follow anyone's lead and before you believe 
what is written. Just be careful. There's so much negativity in this world. Don't adhere to that. Don't believe in that. Don't caught up in that, please. And another question very often is if I have, question is if I have a tattoo, a number on my arm. I do not. That was done in Auschwitz only. And uh, for no other reason than to torment our people, to inflict pain and to dehumanize for no other reason. There were hundreds of camps, major camps, sub camps, but it was in Auschwitz only where they tattooed the number on the arm. Thank you. So many people are thanking you in the chat for telling your story. We really appreciate this. Uh, yeah, someone from the Alaska Jewish Museum is here and said, thank you so much. Um, another person asked, what are your hopes and worries for future generations? Oh, my hopes and, and my wish is that the younger generation, the future succeeding generations will live in a peaceful world. And we can begin by being kind and good towards one another. I keep repeating that and as far as I'm concerned, that is the basis for peace, to be kind and good and respectful towards one another. And we have to begin with our children to instill that in them, 100%. Um, okay, another, <laughs> I always talk, especially when I speak in schools, to please don't waste anything. Don't waste food in particular. Take as much on your plate as you can eat. Don't pile it on, eat some of it and discard the rest. Next time you want to throw bread out, remember the story you heard this afternoon, this evening. Please don't waste anything. Boy, we, we, we do thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of waste. And um, it's not necessary, it shouldn't be that way. For sure. But I. Th I thank you, um, Becky and your staff for again giving me the opportunity to speak to and not with but to so many of those in the audience. And with that, I wish each and every one of you, every one of you who are listening in, your children, your grandchildren, and all succeeding generations, a healthy, happy, productive future in a world of love and peace. Thank you. Mary, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing your stories and experiences. Um, I appreciate it. I can see everyone's thank yous are pouring in. They're giving hearts. They really they're very, very happy to have heard you speak and appreciate yeah. it. And yeah, there's actually a, a high school class in California that had joined us as well. Oh, I'm so glad. That's, yes. that's what that's my life. Students in particular, children in particular, from the age of 10 on up. And I know that this will be uh, recorded and made available. So you can, I don't know if you could, is there a way of letting audiences know that it's appropriate from the age of 10 on up for sure? Sure, yes. Um, well, this will be posted to the library YouTube channel at either later this week or next week. So this can be shared continuously if people want to share this with classes at their homes, wherever they want to share it. Mm -hmm. um, and also, if you want to contact the library, it's 8cplc.org slash contact, or you can give us a call at 813-273-3652. That's a great way to go and reach out to us and see if the video is posted. And if you do want to reach out to Marion, you can contact her on her website. It's fourperfectpebbles.com, or you can actually email her. Marion at fourperfectpebbles.com. So that way, if you have additional questions that we weren't able to get to, or you think of something later, you can go and contact her. Uh, I did see also there were some people that were interested in having Marion speak with them. So that'd probably be the best way to reach you as well. Okay. All right. And, and yeah. each and every one of you, just consider yourself hugged, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you so, so very much. Yes, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And thank you again to Mary. And I hope everybody else has a good evening. Thank you. Good night.